Hello everyone, thanks for joining us for another edition of Texas Insider TV brought to you by the Texas Alliance of Energy Producers. I'm Jim Cardell. President Donald Trump recently announced that he's naming the opioid and substance abuse crisis across America as a national emergency. And just prior to that, Texas and House Speaker Joe Strauss had actually named a select special committee on opioid and substance abuse. Strauss named Panhandle Representative For Price from House District 87 to chair the Special Select Committee on Opioid and Substance Abuse, and we're pleased to be able to visit today with an issue that's affecting over 60,000 Americans on a daily basis, the opioid crisis, with For Price from House District 87. Well, State Representative For Price from House District 87, we appreciate you coming in today to visit with us. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. As I mentioned in the introduction, you have just been named as chairman of the Select Special Committee on Opioid and Substance Abuse, and I want to just jump right into it if we can to respect okay. your schedule. But for um, folks who may not, as this issue has come to the forefront, who may not be familiar with some of the inner operations of a legislative body like the Texas House, You've got an inter, what's called an interim charge, which means you study it prior to the next legislative session in 2019. Tell us a little bit about the actual charge itself from Speaker Strauss, what you'll be studying, and maybe get into some of the process that's involved if you can. Absolutely. The, the interim charge um, really, well, let me back up. First, there was the appointment of the select committee in and of itself. So it's a 13-member committee that I will chair. Um, Representative Joe Moody from El Paso will be the vice chair and we will have a uh, good cross-section of members representing urban and rural areas across the state. Uh, some with backgrounds and, and uh, experiences that are going to be really useful to the committee's work. So once the committee was formed it, we received some interim charges you know with the uh, with the um, with the formation of the committee that requires us to study the breadth and scope of this issue affecting Texans, uh, how it affects different populations. For instance, you know, maybe those with co-occurring mental illness, uh, homeless, uh, maybe veterans, uh, those who um, are receiving mail order prescriptions, things of that nature. So we want to get our hand on a handle on what, what you know, populations are most affected what regions may be most affected, okay. the impact on the criminal justice system, um, how that's happening, or you know what's happening in our juvenile justice system, mm -hmm. how emergency rooms and pharmacies and prescribers are operating within the state, and and this is all you know very timely. The president came out with a public health emergency declaration shortly after this committee was formed, mm -hmm. and so you know it's not just a Texas problem; it's a national problem. But Texas, um, you know, has an opportunity right now to jump out, be proactive, and, and stop some of the things that are causing issues in our communities, but also prevent some worse problems down the road from occurring. And, and I'm really looking forward to, you know, diving in and learning where the challenges are and, and um, maybe where, uh, where the legislature can take some steps. Uh, here in the next legislative session to really make a difference. I like that word proactive um, and I want to get to the mental health work you've done in a minute because we, we were proactive thanks to your leadership and some others but uh, first of all tell us what's involved uh, as I say last session you were chairman of the mental health interim committee charges were issued similar to this but that involves hearings, that involves greasing the skids for bills and legislation in the upcoming session. You've got to hire staff. You've got to be really delving into this whole hog. Tell us about the process, actually, of what you'll be going through. We took that charge so seriously, and just like we will this, this uh, set of instructions and charges from the Speaker's office. In, in 2015, when the Select Committee on Mental Health was formed, uh, we were given a broad set of instructions to basically study, analyze mental health and the mm -hmm. delivery of services in Texas and come up with recommendations. And we traveled the state, uh, all the offices and all the members of the committee 
visited emergency rooms and county jails and talked to law enforcement, went to treatment centers, really? um, state hospitals. We really spent a lot of time learning the issue. We had eight very robust hearings, full days. We had over 110 expert witnesses. The culmination of all this work, we worked harder in that select committee than I think some standing committees do during any legislative session. But we came up with um, a very comprehensive report that had multiple recommendations in them. And so that was really the launch pad going into the 85th session um, that was necessary to successfully pass meaningful legislation, and mm -hmm. we did. And so I give a lot of credit to the members of that committee um, and the folks that we were able to work with in the Senate to get these bills passed uh, because it, it, it has a very good positive effect, not only on the bottom line, the cost of health care and the cost to county taxpayers across the state, but um, patient outcomes are, are going to improve. And so we will take that very same approach with the Select Committee on Opioid and Substance Abuse. We will. Um, you know, spend a few months uh, between now and probably the end of the first quarter uh, learning the issue, spending a lot of time understanding um, the vocabulary and mm -hmm. the, uh, the challenges and, and the stakeholders. And then we will s set into place a series of hearings, um, probably between March and September, where we can spend the time necessary to talk to experts and Go around the state, I suspect. I probably. think we will. Um, I don't know if we will do it as a committee. Uh, I'm not sure we'll have the budget to convene the committee in multiple cities, mm -hmm. but uh, I know the commitment of each individual member. And not only will we have experiences where we can travel around our own, you know, districts, but we will spend time traveling around the state. Some regions, I suspect, are going to be more heavily impacted by this problem than others. And so we need to go where the problems are and understand them. So we'll do that. And then we'll uh, we'll hear from the experts, and we'll produce a report and recommendations in, in the fall of 2018, in advance of the 86 session in 19. So I'm uh, I'm going to approach it very similar, uh, similarly to what we did in the uh, last interim. Uh, it worked very well, and uh, we'll we'll spend the time necessary to come up with some recommendations that I think the legislature will want to take a serious look at. Okay, folks, I want to thank you again for joining us for this edition of Texas Insider TV, brought to you by the Texas Alliance of Energy Producers. We're visiting with State Representative Ford Price from Amarillo and House District 87, who is the chairman of the House Public Health Committee, but now also the Interim Select Committee on opi Opioid and Substance Abuse. Donald Trump representative said the other day when he announced the, the task force and the focus nationally that this epidemic is a national tragedy. As Americans, we cannot allow this to continue. I want to get into it with you, if we can, to the extent you know it. Tell us about some of the numbers, some of the degree that we know Texas has this as an issue or a problem. Again, not to put you on the spot because you're just getting into it, but have you just tangentially getting started heard any numbers or indications of how severe or intense this might be in Texas. I have. I know that uh, since that announcement came out and, and our committee was formed, I've read that you know approximately 126 Americans are dying every day from opioid abuse and addiction. Really? And so that is a significant uh, you know tragedy in and of itself. And 150 so, people approximately a day nationally. I think it was 126 but okay. close to yeah obviously okay. I mean any any you know uh, number that high uh, attributable to one cause is a, a significant issue and, and mm -hmm. certainly a lot of those folks are Texans and um, we, we, we see that, that drug overdoses generally have quadrupled um, the deaths caused by drug overdose, excuse me, have quadrupled since 1999. We've seen statistics about the, the levels of prescriptions issued on opioids or controlled substances in small communities and communities across the state that I think most people would find pretty shocking. Mm -hmm. um, burglaries of pharmacies have uh, actually increased significantly in Texas. We actually passed some legislation last session to increase the penalty because of that. and. A lot of this is because uh, addictions are, are trending upward, and that's uh, that's a scary thing for for a whole host of reasons. And we want to we want to be more proactive. We want to be a little more aggressive in uh, you know managing this correctly and and stopping you know this negative trend. So you know the the statistics aren't good. We've got 
you know, maternal mortality and morbidity issues where we've got a task force that's been um, established and has done some work. And unfortunately, we're seeing some connection to uh, substance abuse and opioid use, um, you know, being the cause of some of these deaths. And so there's a lot of tie-ins to work the legislature's already looked at even recently. Um, but I think that, you know, continuing to focus on these metrics uh, in a really um, objective way will help us understand the challenges better, uh, maybe educate our colleagues and the general public about the, the need to take some action. Um, and, and really, I think uh, it'll help us be a little more uh, innovative with the solutions that we recommend. So I'm very excited about the, the prospect of spending the next year, you know, not only studying this, but, but arriving at some solutions that I think will make a a real meaningful difference to everyday life in Texas. I mean, even just hearing you describe some of that as two old panhandle boys, I'm thinking of the fact that Amarillo is associated with a number of things, but it is a thoroughfare for the nation's beef trade, mm -hmm. cotton, all the crops up there. People don't realize that even a place like the panhandle in a city like Amarillo probably has that transition, that trafficking going on. Sure. I think. You know, we are uh, in a part of our state where we produce significant amounts of food and fiber for not only Texas, but for the entire country. So that is a, a significant economic driver at home. And not only that, but we have, um, you know, agriculture, we have ranching, we have beef packing and processing, poultry, swine, you know, a lot of, a lot of those commodities are produced right up there in the panhandle and then you've got natural gas and oil in the energy sector that is very uh, active and has been for years and it, it also adds to our economy significantly. You have a lot of traffic that goes east-west right through the panhandle so um, you know the, the good thing about that is it is a thoroughfare and it's, it's very accessible. The bad thing is it brings with it sometimes a criminal element. We mm -hmm. have uh, drug trafficking um, that, that really goes through that area, there's there's not a day you won't listen to the news really? and not hear um, some you know van, truck, you know automobile is stopped and it is packed with with uh, with drugs or you know even worse sometimes human trafficking you know is is, mm -hmm. is occurring that's going right through there as well. So these are issues that you know if if we uh, if we continue and I think Texas has done a good job starting to get a you know in front of some of this. But if we I want to get into another. Uh, tangential issue, but it's something that you deserve credit for that you worked on this last session, and it's an example of of you legislators actually doing something that is not necessarily commonsensical for most Texans, and that has to do with the telemedicine bill that you and Senator Charles Swartner, a doctor from just north of Austin, passed last session. Tell us a little bit about that and how health care uh, branches out into some of the rural areas. I'm excited about the, the, the bill that passed because what the telemedicine bill will do is really open access to care all over the 254 counties across Texas. So I don't you know think it matters if you live in a highly populated urban area. If you're in Harris County for instance but it takes you two hours to get through traffic to go see your primary care physician. Um, that's, a, that's an inconvenience and mm -hmm. it's not good. Uh, if you live in rural Sherman County up in the Panhandle, but you drive two hours to get to Amarillo, Texas to visit your primary care physician, that's not convenient either. Mm -hmm. So what this will do um, is it will allow physicians to provide the same service or diagnosis that they could do in an office setting, in a clinical setting, if they feel in their independent medical judgment and they're not violating their standard of care, that they can provide that same service that same treatment or diagnosis uh, over the internet, you know, an audiovisual connection or through store and forward technology, if they can do that, then uh, the bill does not allow a health insurance provider to prohibit payment for that service. So essentially it's going to really open the doors to uh, access and uh, again, there's, you know, over 180 counties in Texas that don't even have a single licensed psychiatrist. So I could see telepsychiatry, for instance, being something that immediately uh, will benefit from uh, this this bill, and and so the healthcare advantages associated with that, the technology use, um, what that will mean to Texans in all areas mm -hmm. of our state, 
I think is uh, is beneficial. So I'm really very happy about it. Well, good work there. Uh, as you mentioned, we take it for granted. I think in some of the cities, compared to what's going out out in uh, going on out in rural Texas. And just to wrap up and be respectful of your time, um, I hadn't thought about this, but. Many folks uh, might wonder how Four Price got his name. <laughs> I personally know Walter Price the Fourth. Correct. But tell us the b background because people are going to be hearing your name in the future. Well, it is a nickname. You're a fourth I, generation Texan. I'm a fourth generation Texan, born uh, and raised in the Panhandle. Um, lived most of my life in Amarillo. Uh, my my you know family on both sides. My parents and grandparents on my dad's side and my mother's side. Uh, long ties and roots in that area, um, but I'm the fourth Walter Thomas Price, you know, and so when I was born, uh, my great-grandfather was deceased, but my grandfather was living in Amarillo, and my dad was living, obviously, in Amarillo, and so you had the third, and you had junior, and I guess uh, in, in somewhat of a Texas tradition, you know, uh, you, you, you could have gone by um, you know, Skip or Chip some or... other nickname, but you know, my dad uh, decided to, to use just the term four, and it stuck. So from the day I was born till till this point, and it doesn't seem odd to me anymore because I've uh, used it for fifty years now. But that is uh, that's where it came from. Well, for Price from House District eighty seven, and chairman of the Public Health and the Select Opioid and Substance Abuse Committee. We appreciate you coming in. Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it, Jim. Folks, we appreciate you joining us again on this edition of Texas Insider TV with State Representative Ford Price, Chairman of the House Humans. I'm sorry, the House Public Health Committee and the Select Committee on Opioid and Substance Abuse. Remember, you're either an insider or you're not. I'm Jim Cardle. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.